I think we're just waiting for Nay. <laughs> hey everybody, really warm welcome to our event. I realised I didn't have my battery charge. Um, my name's Nay Dawson and along with Bex we're hosting this event tonight called Grief and Death in COVID-19, A Christian Perspective. So Bex, just tell us a bit about what's life been like in lockdown for you? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, as Nay said, my name's Bex. Um, I am currently in Southampton. Um, ordinarily, for a lot of the last 10 years, I've been working um, overseas, mostly with more marginalised communities in the Middle East, um, Arabic speakers. Um, but because of what's going on at the moment, I'm back in the UK um, and uh, working in the hospital as a nurse in the emergency department. Um, so, yeah, I, life in lockdown, I feel like feels very different every day um can often depend on how I feel when I wake up in the morning and to be honest some days I just feel sad or have days that are harder um and others I feel really productive um yeah so it's it's kind of a mixture of emotions really missing family and kind of close community people to see things, um but also for, for work to do um and oh, are we still here um yeah so so yeah it's it kind of has its challenges and 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 different things each day really um how about you Nay? how we've how have you found things yeah thanks Beck. so i'm married to john we've got two little girls uh we both work from home so as you can imagine it's been pretty intense and we're desperate for schools to reopen again um there's many things to be grateful for um, but yeah, lockdown's been an interesting time. I sadly saw the death of one of my close friends, not because of coronavirus, um, but that's obviously had a massive impact on me and our community. So I'm really interested to hear tonight from our panel what they've got to say. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for coming, everyone. We would love to hear your questions in the comments. So please start putting them in, whether you're on YouTube or Facebook tonight. We'd really like to respond to your questions that are coming in. Uh, Bex and I are going to host this evening and we're going to one by one welcome our guests. So Bex, you go first. So I would very much like to welcome Professor John Wyatt to the panel, um, who hopefully will appear in a second. Hi, yes, I'm here. Great. Hi, John. I'm Bex. <laughs> the first time I'm meeting you. Um, I have a bio here, which I'm just going to, to share with people, but please correct me if, if I'm wrong. <laughs> so, um, so if I can just let people know, so um, this is John. Um, he's a doctor, author, speaker, and research scientist. His background is a consultant neonatologist and academic researcher focusing on the mechanisms, treatment, and prevention of brain damage in newborn infants. Um, he's now engaged in addressing new ethical, philosophical, and theological challenges caused by advances in medical science and technology, and is also fascinated by the issues raised by rapid advances in AI and robotics, and the interface between cutting edge science and Christian faith. How does that sound? A little bit of a mouthful, I'm afraid. Basically, yeah. I spent most of my life as a baby doctor. Great. <laughs> yeah, I spent most of my life as a baby doctor looking after tiny little scraps uh, mm -hmm. in an intensive care unit. And uh, that was really where my interest in, in ethics, medical ethics, mm -hmm. and also personal experience of, of, of trying to support parents facing tragedy and, and caring for babies who are dying or with or severely damaged. And, and, and so um, I've now retired from the frontline clinical work, but uh, trying to support lots of doctors here in the UK and actually around the world who are um, battling with some of the issues at the moment mm. and, and thinking about some of the ethical issues. Yeah. I was a, a nursing student at Southampton and I heard you speak a long time ago and also was very helped by your book, Matters of Life and Death. Um, and it seems very relevant in these days as well when people are facing difficult decisions. Um, so. Yes, I mean, one of the interesting things is I've always been fascinated by the way that Christians have responded to plagues uh, mm -hmm. in the past, you know, historically, which was a very common factor in the ancient world. And there's quite interesting reports of what happened, but never imagine that uh, we ourselves yeah. might actually live through something rather similar. Thankfully, not quite mm -hmm. as bad as some of the terrible plagues in the past, but mm -hmm. still lots of parallels. Yeah, great. great. Thank you. Thanks, Beck. So our next person on the panel is Yvonne Tullo. Uh, so hopefully Yvonne will come into our panel now. Um, 
you're really welcome with us, Yvonne, even with your video on. It would be nice. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. So, Hi. If, hello, Yvonne. Hello. Welcome in. Hello, um, Ray. Sorry, Scott. well, I thought it was Tullock and then yeah, someone else. I'm not Scottish, <laughs> but, married, but married to a Scot. So I, Dave so Adcock, I who's coming and later called you Yvonne Tullo, so I thought I'd go for that. But it's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Hopefully I'll get, get this better. So Yvonne um, was suddenly widowed in 2008. Um, she was a cathedral canon and her life went into free fall. She realised how little she and others around her knew about bereavement, its difficulties and the needs and how hard it can be to find understanding support. Um, so Ron didn't give up. Uh, since then, she's focused her in attention on ensuring the bereaved of all walks of life find the support that they need. In 2016, Yvonne founded Atalos.org uh, to signpost the bereaved to the range of support services that exist around the UK. So Yvonne, we're really grateful to have you with us tonight. How's life been for you in lockdown? It's been absolutely hectic, um, <laughs> absolutely hectic. So, um, you know, running a charity for the bereaved um, when all of this kicked off has um, has meant that we've been really, really busy. But it's been a good, it's good hectic in many ways because we've been able to um, do a number of different things to try to try to help the situation, which we can talk about um, you know, in this in this webinar. But uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm quite tired. <laughs> <laughs> working around the clock but uh yes oh well we're so grateful you're with us tonight um so bex is going to introduce our next panelist yep so it's my pleasure to introduce um canon dr bill merrington hi hi there welcome um so bill has <laughs> Bill has over 30 years of experience in handling loss issues. Um, as a minister of the Church of England, he has worked in city, town, rural and chaplaincy settings of a hospital, university and high-end security prison. He has a PhD from the University of Warwick in the subject of understanding parental child loss cross-culturally, where he carried out research in the UK, Africa, Lebanon and Japan. He specialised in counselling parents bereaved of children and bereaved children. And he's also written several books on various subjects relating to bereavement, counselling and pastoral care. Gosh, that makes me sound old. Sorry? I'd say that makes me sound old. Oh, no, it sounds like you have great experience. <laughs> a lot to learn from you. Um, Bill, can you tell us a little bit about how life has been for you in lockdown? Well, I'm a bit of an introvert and extrovert. Mm -hmm. So there's times when I love it and I can mm -hmm. do my hobbies and play music or do the gardening and, and mm -hmm. just slow down, do some sculpting. But mm -hmm. then I, I I just flip on that extrovert side of me and I just I get this urge as a as a chapman to I want to dash off back to school and mm -hmm. and see people. So I, yeah. I do know there's a real pendulum going on within me. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you manage with that? Do you have kind of things that help you cope with the the pendulum? Yeah, well, I, I think it's about learning to breathe, really, mm -hmm. uh, and just noticing that breathing and doing relaxing exercises and just recognising when I need to do something more proactive mm -hmm. and, and, you know, be kind to myself to let, let myself go and do that. Yeah, great. Thank you and welcome. Thanks. Okay, and our final panellist, hopefully, if his internet's working, is Dave. I do know how to say his surname. But unfortunately, his internet's not great, so he, we, he may not stay with us for very long. Dave, really warm welcome to, to our panel. Um, I've known Dave for quite a few years. He was a church leader many years ago in New Community Church. But more recently, he's worked as a funeral celebrant for the last 15 years. Um, before then, he was on the leadership of New Community Church in Southampton. And he's also pioneered the EU Welcome, a project supporting migrant workers and is a familiar voice on BBC Radio Solon. In fact, talked about death and grief on Sunday morning. Um, so Dave, we're really I great if you can hear me. I with us hear today. Me. And you, it may not work. Dave, tell us how life in lockdown has <laughs> been. Hopefully it'll work. No, we've not got Dave. I'm sorry. We'll hopefully come back today for some of 
his answers at some point. If not, maybe he can put them in the chat. So really warm welcome this evening. If you've got any questions, please do pop them in the chat for us and we'll have a go at answering them together. Um, Bex, I wonder if you've got a question to get us started. Well, I was just wondering, um, I'm for John, um, I know that you've kind of developed a podcast during this time. And I just wondered whether you could maybe share a little bit about why you decided to start that and kind of what your motivation was and how you how you feel like it can be something that is helpful to to people at this time. Yeah, thanks. So uh, yeah, I, I have started a podcast. Um, I'm doing it with my son, who's a professional journalist. And so we've got it as a kind of two way to and fro, just discussing the, the pandemic and, and our responses to it. Um, it's called Matters of Life and Death, and you can get it on any podcast software. Uh, it's a way of engaging. You know, it's very surreal for me as a medic because um, here I am locked down, and and yet I know that a lot of my close friends and colleagues are, are there on the front line and going through mm -hmm. astonishing experiences. And um, I've been trying, you know, spending time uh, trying to support them and encourage them and also trying to explain to other people what it's like uh, on the front line and and how uh we can we can um be involved and uh it it's um uh, it's a it's a, a very surreal experience I, I i think in particular because death has suddenly become very 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 much on the radar screen i mean for many years i've been trying to persuade people about the importance of having a conversation mm -hmm. about death dying and, and talking to their loved ones about how they would like to die, what are the sort of issues, uh, and trying to help people to think it through. But sometimes it's felt like, like I've been hanging my head on a brick wall because people just don't want to We might be lo lost. So we're, we're all um, confronted with it. Sorry, Johnny. Oh dear, I'm sorry. Am I, so am I back now? Everything you've said. Can you hear me? Yeah, we just missed the last minute or so, John. Um, where you're trying, you're saying you're persuading oh, people to think about death. Yvonne, maybe you could carry on with that because I know that you're doing the same. Yes, I just think about death. What do you think? Yeah. Well. Um, like John, spent many years um, trying to get people to to realise that this is an important issue. Mm -hmm. um, since um, you, you you did my um, the bio on me, since my my first husband died suddenly in two thousand and eight, and I was a minister and realised that uh, I didn't know even as a minister much about grief and the grief journey. Um, I've been on a campaign to try to help um, the church in particular, um, but um, be more. Um, oh, aware and um, knowledgeable on, on the grief journey and more able to support. Um, one of the things that, uh, like uh, John was sort of referring to, one of the things that, um, that I've often said over the years is, is that um, alongside many other people that we've been living in a death denying culture. Um, and, um, but I do think that's changed. And, and, and in the last 18 months, two years or so, um, I've been um, more often saying to people that I think we're actually we were the the the, the tide had, had, had turned, and that we we're actually in a situation where conversations were beginning to open up, and people were beginning to talk more realistically about death and so on. Um, and then, of course, suddenly we we're you know we, we've got it big time, haven't we? So whilst we were on a a bit of a um, a slow um, slow journey with it all, suddenly um, people are having to uh, having to face up to their own mortality and and so on. What sort of questions and kind of path, like ways in which can you, you can start to encourage people really to, to start to have these conversations with people? Any, any well, I don't I don't think that? actually that people need to be um, encouraged to talk about them now. You know, up until up until the COVID-19 um, situation, we were um, actively saying to lots of people, you need to you need to try to get conversation going. Um, but now I think what the, the, the bigger problem is, is, is how well equipped we are to actually deal with the questions that people have got. Um, mm. And, uh, you know, we suddenly we've suddenly found ourselves in a situation where there's a lot of interest in 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 death um, because people are suddenly realizing that actually death happens. We actually do die. Um, mm. For years, we've been trying to pretend that we don't almost. And 
um, and and, it, and and death has been removed from our experience. So you get you know people have been dying in hospices and hospitals, and and bodies are in funeral directors, and you know not in the home anymore, and all this kind of thing. We've got better at medicine, and um, and I've often said what we've tried to we we try to um, pretend that we can buy ourselves out of every situation and we can get medicine for every situation and somehow it won't happen to us and our loved ones until suddenly it does. Um, and now we're in this situation where it's on the news every day and everyone's realising that actually this is something that's real and life is fragile and yes, it could happen to us. So, so I think we don't need to encourage conversations. I think we need to be better equipped at answering people's questions and, and 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 how we deal with with their anxieties over it all. Thanks so much, Yvonne. So we've got a first question from Beth Kelsall. Thank you, Beth, for this excellent question. Uh, Bill, maybe you could have a go answering this. Um, Beth asks, my question is, how do you stop the constant fear of your loved ones suffering? I think it's easy to question everything when you see so many people in serious pain in the run up to death. Naturally, when you've experienced it, it can progress to fear for everyone in your life. Bill, could you help us out with this? Gosh, well, that's a, that's a really good question, um, Beth. Um, I recognise it myself that you, you go to bed and you wonder when you go to bed, oh, will I wake up in the morning with a cough um, or will I be fine? When you wake up in the morning, you feel fine. So you kind of push that <laughs> to the back of your mind. Um, but of course, we're bombarded with so much news on the telly constantly, uh, and that that can certainly arouse people's um, vulnerabilities and anxieties. I think I think when it comes to fear, um, you know, there's a passage which says, "Perfect love casts out fear," and love is about being surrounded. It's about being attached. It's about being in a safe environment with people you trust, who you can share your fear. So I think the first thing is let's acknowledge it. You know, fear is a natural human reaction and it's far healthier to express it than to suppress it. Um, so let's, let's acknowledge it's there, first of all, and sit with it. I will often sit with an emotion and put my hand on my core stomach and just acknowledge that emotion till it, till it um, changes to, to a different emotion. So acknowledge it. And secondly, just talk about it with people around you, people you trust, because you, you find that when you begin to talk about it with others, it brings that sense of balance to the situation. We can't take away death. Uh, we live with it every day. The reality is, often, most of the time, um, it's in our subconscious. Otherwise, we would be a nervous wreck all the time. So we have lots of things where there's risk out there which we push back into our subconscious to allow us to get on with life. And we need others to just give us a degree of support to begin to just bring back that equilibrium. Thanks so much, Bill. Whilst we've got Dave, do you want to, oh. <laughs> Dave, whilst we've got you, do you want to try and answer that question? It's great to have you with us. You'll have a go answering that. Um, I, I, I didn't hear the question actually can you hear me yeah we can yes, hear you yeah. so the question's just underneath your face if you want to have a look um it's about how do you stop the constant fear of your loved ones suffering um yeah i, I it's it's tough isn't it um i guess when uh when i first heard of covid-19 I, I suppose I didn't realise it was as serious as it has turned out to be. I kind of, I suppose I was one of those people who thought it was going to be like the flu. So it was almost like, well, bring it on, let's get it over with and then I'll get on with life. But of course, it's not turned out that way. I'm now grateful. Um, those prayers were not answered, if you see what I mean. Um, but but. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's 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 tough, isn't it? it it's like, you know, we, we when people ring up or when people are in touch and they, you know, in the past when people say, how are you? They're not really bothered how you are. It's just something they use as a as a means of language. But I think now when you call someone, you say, how are you? You kind of mean it, don't you? You know, want to know how are you getting on? Mm. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Dave. Any other panelists want to have a go at that? If not, we've got more questions yeah, coming I, in. If I could say something to that, I just to um, I just love what Bill had to say there about perfect love casts out fear. And I think, um, you know, there are two ways in which people experience love. One is through us and one is through the presence of God. Um, and, you know, if we're going to help people to um, not be so fearful, then we need to be people who are um, who are really actively sharing the love of God in this situation and, and, and really, you know, doing everything we can to love others who are suffering. Um, and then we, you know, we'll have less to fear when we see when we see pe the people of God um, stepping in and doing wonderful things. And and the other the other aspect of of, of it all is is God is love. Is that um, I don't know whether other guys on the panel have, would would echo this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you will. That in visiting people um, in suffering situations, I have always been gobsmacked at how I'm the one who worries more about them than they do about themselves. Um, and that's something to do with the grace of God, um, who just does something amazing in, in really difficult situations for people um, and just places within their hearts some peace and, um, and something that makes them be the ones who minister to me um, when I go and see them. So um, I'm just sort of throwing that out there. And I've often thought to myself, if ever I'm in that situation, I hope that I have that same measure of, of God's grace um, in my life. John, do you yeah, I'd say that, that's my experience too. And um, But one of the things I wanted to add was that often fears are related to sort of terrible fantasies. Uh, it's possible, particularly in the middle of the night, for our mind to get completely carried away with horrible fantasies. And my experience, you know, working as a doctor is that, is that so often the reality is, is is not half as bad as the fantasy. It's it, and and I think pe many people, unfortunately, sometimes it comes from horror movies or from other things they've seen, films or whatever. That they have these fantasies of, of, of a terrible death, and and actually of having had the privilege of caring for many dying people at, over the years, that is not the reality. Um, and particularly, thank God for palliative care and for the. Uh, the medications and other ways of caring for people we have. Um, and so, uh, yes, of course, we can't airbrush it all and, and say, you know, death is just nothing at all. Of course, it is, a, it is still a terrible enemy. But I think these terrible, fantastic fears need to be confronted by actually the, the reality is not like that. How do, we, how do we help people to kind of realise that? Or are there are things we can help... For people to, I, to manage that one of the things is, is, sorry what one of the things i think is actually what we need to have is the stories of people who've died well you know in in the in the olden times people used to die within the community they would die within home sometimes they would actually die within the local church you know and 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 people would be gathered around and praying for them and and all the rest nowadays people die you know, behind curtains in a in a very medicalized setup, and I, I think we need to bring the stories of, of of how people have 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 faced the end of life, and uh, and 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 see that as part of our community rather than something that's just pushed away into the hospital. We've got another question here. Which, oh, sorry. Over, over the years, we've we've professionalized death. So we've become more remote from it. I remember as a as a child, when my grandmother died, we had a lady in the street who came to lay my grandmother out. Mm -hmm. And I saw my grandmother the very next day she died in the coffin in the dining room. And I had a little look. And I have a very clear memory of that, not in a negative way, actually, because I was surrounded by a family who supported me and made it seem quite normal. Mm -hmm. but, but today many of us have lived a large chunk of our lives remote from death so we've not built up any resilience or understanding of it to to minimize our fears and i guess too often we rely on television which often dramatizes death um so i think i think john's john's so right there's so many good stories out there that people don't hear i guess something that i in the, working in the hospital have been really struck by is Kind of this the separation that COVID nineteen has has resulted in in terms of people coming into hospital and yet not being able to have family with them or kind of support networks or 
or even for family members to be able to witness um, their loved ones dying or kind of having that part of the grieving process, I guess. Um, and I've got a question here um, from some from John Joe Risbridger, also my housemate, um, which says, do you think there will be a big impact on the grief or grief process for those relatives who aren't able to say goodbye to their loved ones during this time due to visiting restrictions? Um, John, do you want to, to kick us off? Oh, your sound is gone. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Um, I do think this is one of the terrible evil things about this pandemic, the way that it has caused a separation at, at the very time when, when it's most important that this human contact uh, is there and it's a possibility to hold a hand, to, um, to share, uh, you know, the idea that all that is, is is it's not possible to engage in any of that. It just seems to me very evil. And I, and I do think there is going to be, I'm afraid, a, a sort of complicated grief. It, it, it's, it's something that's really interfering with the normal grieving process. Mm -hmm. and, and actually it's also for the health professionals. I think it's, um, health professionals have found this extraordinarily stressful. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just talking to a junior doctor early today who was describing uh, being the route between the wife who was at home and the husband who was desperately sick in the intensive care unit and the wife who clearly they had a, a, a fantastic marriage, but it was just been ripped apart. Mm -hmm. And he was unconscious in the intensive care unit and she was asking what was going on. Mm -hmm. and, and this very junior doctor was somehow trying to, mm -hmm. to be sensitive and care and, 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 and it just thought, what a, what a terrible situation mm -hmm. to be in. There's, um, um, I, I have quite a, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I, I've yeah. had quite a few conversations with bereavement charities over the last few weeks um, in, in all of this. It's been quite interesting to hear um, people's um, experiences um, in this. And um, those that deal with suicide, for instance, um, have been talking about in lockdown how that's gone right down obviously because it's difficult for people to take their own lives but also there are um, studies i believe with in times of crisis and so on um where uh, where people have an adrenaline rush and they and they they sort of survive and everything um and initially um mm -hmm. and and actually people go to the support services far less at that time mm -hmm. but they but then there's this big rush afterwards so what the bereavement charities are expecting, they're saying there's been less um, demand initially, and it's just starting to now increase. And when, where you, where you, whereas you'd expect there'd be quite a lot of demand at the moment, but actually what they're expecting is a tsunami of grief in the autumn, mm -hmm. um, when things start to become a bit more normal for people, um, and uh, and they're not dealing with dealing with crisis for themselves in their own lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I had a question about that. Yeah, kind of, are we going to see something after lockdown kind of lifts or life goes back to inverted commas normal? Yes, and and um, as was just being said, it, very much expecting it all, you know, all grief around this time to be complex and complicated mm -hmm. because people have not been able to um, to express their feelings, see their loved ones, go to funerals, all of those kinds of things. Um, grief has, in a sense, been put on hold and it's got lots of complications. Yeah, thank you. And certainly yeah, I've I, mean, I think that's, um, I mean, that's true for many people. I think it will become more traumatic because they've not been able to even start the process in, in, a, in, a, in a normal kind of way. Um, but I think it's, I think it might be traumatic actually for people who have not just lost relatives through COVID, because a lot of people are losing relatives all the time, mm. not through COVID. And of course, we, we never hear about that. And I think they may well have issues afterwards when we get back to some kind of normality, because I think they may well feel somehow their grief has just not been recognised or, or acknowledged. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that, Bill. We sadly saw a close friend die at the start of lockdown, not because of coronavirus. And... 
I've been asking the question, how do we as a group of friends grieve together? Because that's what we've done. How do we grieve with the family? It's just impossible. Um, so we've got a great question from Miles here. How do we grapple with the isolation and loneliness of grief with a lockdown, which just compounds these issues? Bill, I know that you've written quite a bit. On grief, and actually, we ordered your book, 101 Ways to Cope. Um, when someone died, we've been working through it with my daughters because they knew the person that died. So thank you for your excellent resources. But do you think you could have a go at answering this question? Well, you know, it'd be lovely to give you a simple answer, wouldn't it? <laughs> and and we we live in that kind of society, don't we? We want a quick fix with C19. Um, but I want to say to you, over many years of study and grief, grief is complex. It's not straightforward. There's endless theories out there about grief, and there'll be new ones after after C19, I can assure you. Um, but we, we, we come into grief, and, and when it happens, you know, there's so many different factors. Was the loss sudden or gradual? How was I involved with that? Um, how do I perceive myself to be similar to the person who's died? Have I had previous losses in my life? How have I dealt with those previous losses? What's my belief system about loss and death? Have I worked through what I think about it? Now, all of those little factors come together like a jigsaw. And I often think someone in grief is trying to put the jigsaw together of all their assumptions in life, including their religious faith, which has suddenly gone up in the air. So it's understanding, understandable that we feel lonely and isolated. Now, some people I've heard during, during this time, actually in their loss, actually it helps them because they've got time to be by themselves, to think, not to go to work, and to really work it through and have time to think about it. For other people, they're going crazy. Uh, they want to get out. They want. They don't want to focus on the grief. They want to go and do something practical. So I guess I'm simply trying to say um, the answer will will vary according to the individual. Um, but in the end, the answer to loneliness, which is actually the biggest epidemic in our country, which we don't seem to realise, um, is connectivity, isn't it? We, we have to we have to try and create some connectivity in which people feel safe enough, whether it's by phone or Skype or two-metre conversation, um, to feel safe enough with another person who is willing to come and sit with them mm -hmm. and listen to them. Someone once said, you can't speak to me unless you sit with me on my morning bench. And I think that's the beginning of the answer of loneliness to have someone who's willing to sit with us, not, not with the answers from professionals, but someone who's just willing to come alongside and perhaps just be silent, just be mm -hmm. silent. I've interviewed so many people who've lost children and they will tell me, and at first I didn't believe it, but they'll tell me, oh, people cross the road to avoid me. And you know, when you've heard that a hundred times from a brief mother, you think it must be true. And they do. They do avoid. Not to be cruel. Because it's because they feel helpless. They don't want to think about the death of another child or their child. They don't want to see a person cry in front of them. And they, they, ha they haven't got the answer. So they avoid. And yet endless parents have said to me, I don't want answers. In fact, that's the last thing I want because it won't be correct. And that's even from religious people. What I want is someone who can come and just sit with me in my pain. And I think that's the beginning of the answer of loneliness. Thank you so much, Bill. John, have you got anything to add to that? No, just, just to echo it, really. I mean, I've, I've had the privilege of caring for many people who've lost babies and young children and they have said that um this experience of, pe of being avoided and even ostracized is is unfortunately quite common but um i i think uh the privilege of just being able to sit with people 
and and you know from a from a christian point of view it, it, it's it, it's the privilege of being able to just share something just be there mm -hmm. share something of the presence of god um there's a lovely quote which i came across and i've often used it it says suffering is not a question which demands an answer Hmm. And it's not a problem which demands a solution. It's a mystery which demands a presence. Mm -hmm. And and that's all we can be. But it's all the most wonderful thing that we can be, just to be the presence with people who are suffering. Mm -hmm. Thanks so are there much. Ways, are there, I was just going to ask, is, is, are there ways that in the, in these days when we're not necessarily able to go and sit next to somebody, kind of just practically how we can... I know for Nay, kind of maybe thinking through how she supports this family through their grieving process. Yvonne, do you, do you kind of have any thoughts of, of how we can be thinking more, more yes. proactively well, about As soon as we went into lockdown, um, I wrote a little script for a, uh, for a little film, um, which, we, which we've got on our website called Contact, Listen and Bless. Um, for people in lockdown, for those who are, who are bereaved, um, there's so much that one can do um, to go to come alongside them without having to visit them. Mm -hmm. You can get in touch um, by phone. Um, you can send messages. You can send cards. You can send letters. You can send photographs of the loved one. You know, there's so many things that you can do um, to get in touch. Um, and then um, listen, um, as as uh, Bill was just saying, this coming alongside is about listening, and we can listen very easily without having to go and visit. Um, we can phone up and just say, tell me about it. Tell me, you know, how are you feeling today? What happened, um, you know, when that person went into hospital or whatever it is? Just tell me, just tell me and tell me again. And I often say to people, tell me in more detail than you did before. Mm -hmm. What else can you remember about it? You know, so get people to talk and be there to listen and um, and then and ask those questions. And then bless, we say, you know, just shower these people with nice things. Can send presents or little messages that are, you know, good messages. You know, anything you can think of that makes them feel good about themselves um, and today, um, so that they can see that life is worth living. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's what I'd suggest. That, and you know, in lockdown, but obviously out of lockdown, go and turn up, knock on the door. We say dare to dare to get in touch. Um, as Bill was saying, it's and um, John, it was. It's. I mean, I was as a widow, and, and I work with with those who are widowed. People crossing the road is com very, very common for those widows. For anybody who has um, a high impact death or a traumatic death or something, people don't know what to say. Um, and so we sort of say, dare to get in touch. You know, dare to go up to that person and say, I'm so sorry, I don't know what to say. Mm. Because that's actually just what they want to hear. Yes. Thank you. And I have to say that although, um, well, I'll often say this in funeral talks, actually, that it's great that people turn up to a funeral and support the family today and perhaps in a few weeks' time. But actually, if, if you really care, it's about supporting them in about six months mm -hmm. when it's dark yeah. and you're closing the curtains at half past four. Mm -hmm. And that's when people feel, will feel far more isolated and down in the winter, in the dark months. And... and Sometimes if you've got someone who'll just phone you consistently on the same day at the same time at that night, even if it's just, hi, are you okay? 30 seconds conversation. Just that consistency. Yeah. It just gives a clear message. I am not alone. Yeah. I am supported. Mm -hmm. and of course, that's exactly where the church should have a real full ministry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you. Great, thanks so much for all your questions coming in. Please put some more questions in the chat. We'd love to answer them. Um, John, I'd quite like to ask you a question about the pandemics. You spoke about it before, and I've read one of your articles that you've written on pandemics. Um, can you just share a bit about how Christians have reacted in pandemics that might encourage us today? Um, what have you been learning and writing? Yeah, thanks. One of, one of the really interesting things uh, about the ancient world was that um, the Hippocratic doctors, the doctors who were trained in the Hippocratic um, oath and so on, which was actually something that happened before Christianity. It came out of a, a Greek mystery religion. 
And um, their teaching was that if someone was dying, you should actually not look after someone who was dying um, because it was very bad for your professional reputation. And that's, this was um, actually part of the sort of standard teaching for Hippocratic doctors. And so it's, it's quite well recorded that when these terrible plagues swept into um, these ancient towns, the first thing that the doctors did was head for the hills and uh, just get out of harm's way as rapidly as possible. Um, and, and yet in the, in, the, in the days of the early church, there were these small groups of Christians in these uh, cities, and they were often called either the atheists because they didn't have any idols, or they were called things like the Galileans or the Nazarenes. And you know, there were these weird uh, small sect um, and the question is, how are they going to respond when the plague comes sweeping in and these ter terrible descriptions of people dying in the streets? Um, because one of the things that people did was push the infected people out of their homes and leave them in the streets to die. And there are first-hand accounts that what the Christians did is they went out into the streets and they brought the, the people back into their own homes mm -hmm. and they cared for them and they washed their wounds and they nursed them and it said many of them died because they got the infection, they passed it on to their, themselves. Uh, and yet there are some church historians who say that the ways that Christian responded in the, in the time of plague was so extraordinary. The ancient world had just never seen anything like this, that it was one of the principal reasons why the early church grew so rapidly. So other people watching this said, I just can't believe the way these Christians are responding, but I want to be part of it. And um, so I must say, when I read those accounts, you know, and I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a doctor and a carer and a, and a Christian, I, I feel almost ashamed to be called by the same name, you know, as these people, as these early Christians who had none of the benefits of, of, of modern medicine, but who just showed sacrificial caring. But actually, you know, the same story has, you can trace it um, all through all the different pandemics, right up to the Ebola virus epidemics in Sierra Leone, where there were a whole bunch of uh, health professionals who, who deliberately went to care for people dying of Ebola, even though they knew that the protective equipment was useless and they were at high risk. And some of them died. Um, and some of them were Christians. And some of them you know, were, were, weren't and were other, other faiths and so on. But it was that self-sacrificial caring at a time of plague is something that is actually part of our history. Mm. Thanks, John, so much. And in that time, we've got some more questions coming in. Rose, a friend of mine, um, is asking, can you please explain about living with death every day? Now, I think, was that Bill? Did you mention that earlier? Well, I, that? I might have done, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I th I think ever to say was that, well, think, think about it as a little baby. Um, the baby is putting together a whole a whole jigsaw picture of how the world works. And if they're securely attached, that allows them to explore and to feel safe. So they're building lots of assumptions. We live in what we call an assumptive world. We form this view. For example, um, well, the example I often give is we make the assumption that ceilings are safe, don't we? If you look up now, wherever you are, uh, look at your ceiling. Looks pretty solid, doesn't it? I used to live in a vicarage, and one one Monday I walked in on my day off, and in the lounge we had a tiny crack on one corner and a tiny crack on the other, and I heard this, and the ceiling was cracking. I thought, gosh, I'll go and get a broom. I don't think I knew what I was going to do with the broom. I, I think I was going to put it on the table, thinking it would reach the the the, the ceiling and would hold it up. And in fact, I just got out of the room, got to the door when the whole ceiling collapsed and destroyed the lounge. Now, everywhere I went for the next six months, I went off lecturing, I remember. And um, I was just about to lecture about bereavement and loss. And I kept saying, hello, my name's Bill Merrington, as I was looking at the ceiling. <laughs> and I kept looking at the ceiling because, you see, my assumption that ceilings are safe had been shattered. 
Now, so in one way, that's what I'm trying to say. That assumption that our life is secure has now been shattered. Mortality is much nearer us. And we we need at some point to face the reality that we are mortal and we're going to die. And that might mean if you're an atheist, then you're going to be, I used to be a chemist. So if you're an atheist, you might think, well, I'm going to become just ashes, neutrons, proteins, electrons, spinning and dancing in this wonderful world. That's the atheist view. You may have a Christian view, which is that I'm going to something better or bigger or more exciting or more secure. Um, and at some point we have to formulate what is our, what is our assumption? What is our belief? about death because if we don't then it is going to nag at us every single day on the other hand going back to this baby yeah you know, i've got a new grandson and i'm watching him he's had to give up having breast milk from his mother which is a loss to have the pleasure of eating rusk hoping it might become exciting food like bananas and eventually curry is now just giving up sitting still or being cuddled all the time to having to crawl. He's going to have to give up crawling if he wants to walk. So right through his progression and right through his life, he is learning about loss. Loss is something we experience every day. In every beginning of a day, there is an ending. So I think I think we need to formulate some, some belief system which actually can sit with that fact and come to terms with it. If we come to terms with it, our fear will be greatly diminished. Now, for me as a Christian, my understanding of that is, um, if I just wrote an article today for the school that I work in, they wanted to know, what did I learn about lockdown? And at the end, I said, well, I've learned that actually, you know, if, if death knocks on my door, it will be okay. Because I have a belief system which says I'm loved, I'm cared for, and that the one who was with me before I was born will be with me after I die. Now, that belief system I do live with every day because I have to choose to believe it every day. But the belief becomes an assumption and it gives me confidence and a sense of calm. I'm not quite sure that's what she was wanting, but um, she's very welcome to come back to me. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And Rose, come back if you want to ask more questions to Bill or others on that. Um, Bex, you're going to ask a question next. Yeah, so we've got another question here, I guess, from someone who's involved in church ministry or kind of responsible for pastoral care within the church. Um, just about kind of any advice that you might have for pastors during this time, seeking to support their congregation or, or other people pastorally um, from a kind of more social distant um, standpoint, I guess. Yvonne, do you want to, to start us off? Whilst, um, whilst we're all so socially distant, it's very difficult. And all we can do is what I was saying before about mm. uh, constantly being in touch um, and being that person um, who we've been talking about, who's who's, who's there and, and known to be there in support um, and blessing people and so on. So I would just say, do as much as you can to be in touch with that person, to be listening to that person, to be loving that person, to be caring for that person and for them to know that they're not alone. Um, mm -hmm. When we're not um, socially distanced, there's a lot more that can be done. But um, one of the things that we've been involved in is, is actually trying to help churches to do something between times as well, um, to help people actually facilitate their grieving um, process, their grief journey, um, as, as, as much as is possible in these difficult circumstances. It's not ideal at all. We know that. Um, but um, one of the things that I've been involved in um, and, and I am involved in is running a, a, a course for the bereaved called the Bereavement Journey course at Holy Trinity Brompton. Mm -hmm. Um, it's been running for many years and I and I was handed the baton. So I, it's a, a, a very dear friend of mine, Jane Unjun, um, devised it many years ago, tried and tested. Works really well for people bereaved in all sorts of situations. 
Um, so what we've been trying to do is is bring is, is enable that to be um, run by churches online um, across the country. So we've just literally um, um, this week got to a point where we're actually saying to churches and to pastors to 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 ministers, you know, will you consider um, running this course online? Um, over the next few weeks for people in your geographical area, your city or your county or something, um, so that grieving people can have some means of being able to feel like their story can be heard and they can begin to process their loss. And so we've just adapted um, the, the resource to make that possible. Um, and what we really want is, is for the country to hear the message um, that the church is, is, is responding to this situation. Um, as best we can at this point in time. Um, and that ecumenically ch churches of all different types and flavors and shapes and sizes, um, you know, are doing something um, for mm -hmm. the grieving people in their communities. And, and the idea being that it's not the most ideal because meeting face to face is by far the best way of, of loving and caring for people. But um, it is a way and, and, and the hope would be that when we can, um, we can, meet again that these courses will actually run face to face by the by these churches that they'll move into running them face to face so that's something that i would really recommend um pastors do how can people find out about about that um if they go on to this um the initiative that i'm, I'm involved with, with, with our charities involved with with church of england um care for the family um and hope together which is an ecumenical um mission um group um, it's called Loss and Hope, Loss and Hope. We launched it, um, literally this is God's timing, on the very day of the first coronavirus death in the UK, March the 5th at Lambeth Palace. Um, it was a launch to, of, of a joint church initiative to together equip each other in supporting the bereaved, um, to equip the churches in supporting the bereaved. And it was, we had a number of, of, of key church leaders from across denominations at Lambeth Palace on that evening of March the 5th. And the very next day we heard of the first COVID, COVID death and everything went into landslide. Mm -hmm. So I really feel that God was behind um, that launch. And since then, we've been trying to ensure that our resources as best we can are, are available online. And we've got lots of training that we've just been um, converting to online. Um, and, and, so the, so the website to go to is Loss and Hope. That is designed for helping churches and ministers um, to support the bereaved and will hopefully increasingly have more and more resources on it. Um, and we're inviting people to tell us about good stuff um, that we can put on there for other people. But it's a sort of a central place for, for ministers to equip them in, in supporting the bereaved. Thank you. That's great. I think another pastoral issue which um, is to do with is not those who are bereaved but those who are paralyzed by fear. We, we, we talked a bit about fear before but I think there are a lot of people within our churches, particularly older people, uh, some of whom have been sheltering alone, uh, some of whom for instance may have uh, other diseases which means they feel particularly vulnerable. They may have been told by the NHS that they had to, to shelter at home and once these fears are, 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 are arise, it's, it's very, very hard, as we, we talked about before, to, to control them. And I, I think this is a real pastoral issue mm -hmm. where we need help, um, particularly, I think, um, about hope, that, that mm -hmm. what we need to learn more about is it what it means to practice the discipline of hope, you know, that hope is not just a, um, a nice fuzzy warm feeling that everything's going to be okay uh it's actually a kind of daily discipline where i choose to say i'm going to focus my mind um not just on what happens beyond the grave but on what's going to how god is going to use the, this day and and this next week and this following week and so on and and Particularly, I think, again, when we're, when we're exposed to the media a lot, you know, and I, I, I'm a bit of a news junkie and I'm following all the news and seeing the graphs and all the rest. But actually, it's really bad for me just to be constantly exposed to this negative stuff. And, and sometimes I just need to switch it off and start remind myself about practicing this discipline of hope. And I think pastors and teachers could, this is an issue which we really need to grapple with and, and help one another 
to practice this, to live in hope and to communicate it to others. I agree, John. I think it's a huge issue in our churches today. I've, uh, I've led churches for 30 years, but now I sit in the pews and um, I don't find that easy because I find we struggle with application. We struggle with teaching how to put our Christian faith into everyday application. How do I live with the COVID fear? How do I live with my grief and loss? Um, how do I cope with elderly parents and the anxiety of all that? Uh, these are pastoral issues which really need to be taught from the front. Um, I also think that, I mean, certainly one church I had, I had a bereavement counsellor on my staff who was following all the cases up. And then every every quarter, um, four times a year, we'd have a Thanksgiving service and invite anyone in that community who'd had any kind of loss so that they could come together and feel part of us. And I think we need to create rituals like that which will um, allow us to go on ministering. And I think in that teaching, we need to be able to say to these bereaved people, look, church isn't easy. It's full of happy songs, and we want you to be cheerful all the time. You know, I used to say to people who are widowed, come late and leave early. Yeah. We have to protect people in grief. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we need to create church structures which just allows that higher level of pastoral care. Mm. I couldn't yeah. agree more. I think um, one of the problems that we can sometimes find within the life of the church is that we fall into a fix it God um, mm. mode. And um, I, one of the things that I do regularly is I run workshops for, for people who are bereaved, with, who have faith questions in bereavement workshops, and people come along. It's an optional thing, and people come along and they ask their um, anonymous questions. And I find over and over and over again people talking. Um, well, firstly, the main questions are all about God and, their, and, and feeling like God has let them down, mm -hmm. um, and, and their, their questions about life after death. But, um, but a lot of the, the, the God has let me down has to do with their experience of church and their understanding of God that's conveyed by the church. And, uh, and so much of what we do within the life of the church is, is, is present a God who, who can fix your problems and will fix your problems. And we know that God can fix the problems, but it's all about as if, you know, come here, be prayed for, have, do this, do that, and, and it will be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, and rather than actually helping people to realize that God talks about being with us in our suffering and that the call to the Christian faith is to take up our cross to follow Jesus. Um, and there needs to be, um, a, 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 I believe, a, a much stronger emphasis upon suffering being part of life and, and, and very much part of the Christian experience and story. And then within the life of the church, people who are going through difficult times will find that they are embraced. Um, and loved by it. Um, so again, part of what we've been we've been doing is is trying to encourage churches to to, to consider their accessibility to the bereaved, um, and sort of putting a challenge out there for for Christian for ministers and pastors to be to think about how bereavement friendly their church is, and that's the whole life and, and ministry of the church. And thinking about all different aspects and how easy is it for that that grieving person to feel like they embraced and loved in this context. Thanks, Yvonne. John, could I go back to you on your point about practicing hope? Could you just talk a little bit more about what that looks like um, on a daily basis? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think it was GK Chesterton who said there are two sins against Christian hope. There's the sin of presumption and there's the sin of despair. And it's interesting that he he describes them as, as, as something that that are that are some kind of failure. You know, either we fall into believing everything's going to be fine, which is this kind of happy clappy Christianity, which I'm afraid has rather infected uh, a lot of a lot of churches, um, or we fall the other way into despair, into a, a sense that it's all hopeless, that nothing will, will, can ever get better, and. And instead of that, there's there's this that Christian hope is neither of those things. 
it's it's realistic it's solid but it's something that has to be practiced and and uh and and, and it's a daily practice i think you know i i have to try and remind myself each morning to about what am i hoping for what where is my foundation and and to remind myself of um of the things to be thankful for and and of the um of the presence of god of of the love of my family and friends and of the opportunities that god is giving me today and it's a it's a kind of a daily process of choosing what i'm going to focus on what am i going to think about what am i going to allow my mind to become preoccupied and that, i think particularly at the moment in the pandemic there's so much bad news there's so much uh frightening stuff uh and it's and it's easy for us to become just overwhelmed by all this and and i do think there is a real time to switch it all off and then to develop these these disciplines these habits of of, of each day thanks john that's so mm -hmm got quite a few more questions coming in please keep sending your questions in um beth's written a brilliant question how do you support someone long term with grief so i think bill maybe mentioned it's six months after when the curtains are closing that we need to remember our friends um so yeah bill have you got any more thoughts on that about long term supporting people yeah so what, what what do we mean by long term you know i've i've done some research on people who have, have been bereaved of teenagers uh and i interviewed them um when they'd been bereaved 15 20 years previously and i contacted as many as i could a while ago so they've been bereaved now 30 years and um so that really is long term isn't it i mean um, my theory is that for some loss like children um, grief is a lifelong journey. I wrote a book called Suffering Love because parents go on suffering because they go on loving that which they've lost. And, and, and that's true for Christians too, of course, who might feel that their child has gone to heaven. But actually, you know, they don't want their child in heaven. They want their child to be with, their, with themselves, which is a, a, a rightful thing as a parent. So how do you support someone that long without getting fatigued? Um, well, first of all, I think you have to recognize um, you can't carry the problem. It's, it's not yours, first of all. You can share it as much as someone's willing to share it with you. Um, but it's not yours. It's their journey. You have to deal with your journey. And that's about balance, isn't it? Us counselors are very good at having boundaries to protect ourselves. So we have supervisors who will counsel us every month to protect us. So if you're supporting someone long term, you in turn need somebody else to support you. Um, secondly, you need to pace it. It's, it's no good saying, oh, I'm going to support you. I'm going to come and visit every week. No, you won't. You'll let them down. Mm. Far better to say, you know, I'm going to support you for three months and then I'm going to encourage you to join a grief group. Um, or, or to be more realistic and say, okay, I'm going to remember you every anniversary and every Christmas and every birthday. Um, that actually can be more beneficial in the long run than someone diving in and being in very intensive with your care and then getting fatigue. So think about your own self-care. That's where it begins. Thanks so much, Bill. Anybody else want to add into that? Well, I think um, the, the the anniversary thing is a very big one because um, you know grief doesn't end if it's um, it's a high impact um, bereavement. It never ends, um, and and it's it's not that difficult to to support people on a long term basis by just making a note of the date of the death or or the funeral or. The birthday or whatever the sort of the, the occasions when it's going to feel so painful for that person um and it doesn't take much to send them a message or to pick up the phone um and just say you know i i, I recognize that that today could be a particularly that a difficult day for you um and i'm here for you that that is um, something that people can do on a long-term basis and really feel so special i 
Um, it's tw 12 years since my first husband died and um, a one family member, two or three family members, um, get in touch with me on the anniversary of his death and his birthday and times like that. And it's very special. Mm. Mm. Thanks. Yeah, my mum died 16 years ago and I still appreciate those people who, who remember and just will, will drop mm. a message on the anniversary mm. or things like that. It does mean a lot. Mm. Um, and it's just so comforting to be able to use the deceased person's name again. Yeah. Yes. And often the bereaved, they're just desperate, mm. wanting to talk about that person, whereas many people think, oh, I'll not mention him or her because mm. she might get upset. Mm. Um, my message is, no, use the person's name. And to know that they haven't been forgotten mm. after, you know, a number of years and so on, because you don't yeah. forget them. Mm. So, um, to know that's that somebody right. else hasn't forgotten them as well mm. is such a very special thing. Um, and that's yeah. what brings me to this whole sort of thing that, you know, with churches, there's so much more that we can do um, in remembering and rituals. And, um, you know, we do we do our funerals well, but, but what about after that? Because grieving people don't forget. Mm. Um, and these people are always in their hearts and their minds, and particularly on anniversaries and special days. And there's so much more we can do as churches to support people in the long run um, in, in, on those occasions. Mm. And, and exactly we still the same, really sorry, exactly the same is true with, with people who've lost children. Sorry, John. <laughs> Do you want to carry on? <laughs> no, no, I was, I was just saying exactly the same is true with parents who've lost a child. That uh, to have an opportunity to talk about the child they lost, mm. far from that being a terribly upsetting, tragic thing, is actually they love to have the opportunity, even if it brings tears. Mm. It's it, it's very fulfilling. One of the things I learned as a baby doctor was that something that's sadly quite common is where there are twins and one of the twin dies and one of the twins survive. And what tends to happen is people never want to talk about the twin that died. Mm -hmm. And um, and and many people forget there ever was another baby. Uh, but one of the things I learned whenever I met them was always to mention the twin who died. And, uh, mm -hmm. and people always responded positively. And it was something to have such an opportunity to, they never forget. And it's and it's wonderful if other people remember as well. And I think they need to, you know, they need with children, they need to process they're asking the question, well, you know, would my child have gone to school? Would they have gone to university? Would they now, 20 years later, be getting married? Uh they journey with the child along with the other children of that age as they progress. And they need to be able to talk about that. They need to be able to um, process those questions. We may not have the answers, mm -hmm. but we can help them to find an answer that they can sit with. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, a big question still that's coming in is how do we do that now collectively in COVID-19? You know, we can still only see six people maximum. Um, so Jenny Brown's asked a great question. Um, Usually we engage and face death individually or as a family. How can we help our local community engage with and respond to death together as a community? So anyone got any thoughts on that collective grieving within a community? Sadly, I think that the, um, the church has, has missed a bit of an opportunity here. Um, and there's an initiative um, that is not a church initiative, which is, is wonderful, I think, um, called Shine a Light. Um, so a number of charities have, have, have clubbed together to try to encourage people to, to um, light a candle or, a, or have a torch at, and, and shine it at the, out their window or, in their, or out of their door at nine o'clock every Saturday as a collective um, moment of acknowledging um, people who have died in the community. Um, so not just about someone, someone who's grieving themselves, but to actually stand by others in the community and say, we recognize that you've lost somebody and we're here for you. Um, I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, and, but I think it, it follows through that, that um, churches could do something similar. And, um, and it, I, I, I feel sorry for ministers because it's really difficult when churches are closed and your hands are tied and our hands are tied and there's very little that we could do. When I was in a, 
when I was um, canon for mission in a cathedral, I would, you know, I just know what I would have done. I'd have opened up the cathedral and had everyone come here. Um, you know, bring your flowers, bring your, your mementos, bring your pictures, you know, and let's hang prayers on a tree or whatever, you know. But you can't do that when your buildings are closed. But um, but it's just it's occurred to me that, you know, it struck me that 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 nobody's thought about things doing things in the open air. And um, there isn't any reason why why churches or ministers couldn't string together, for instance, a, a couple of old branches in, in a cross and put them on the on the, the church in the church grounds and say, come here and put your flower here with the name of the person or whatever. And, you know, and together we can um, we can remember those people and say that um, we're here for you. I think that's a really, really good answer, actually, because I think over the last couple of decades, um, people have been bypassing the church and going to the to the roadside mm. where the death took place. Mm. They've been doing their memorial at that point of death. And I think mm. um, it's no good the church say, no, we've lost touch. Mm. Uh, we need to go to that point of mm. contact. And mm. uh, like you say, it may be just in the in the village green somewhere outside, but we, mm. we have to meet them where they are if we're going to encourage them then to come back for regular memorials within our church building. Mm. Mm. And you know, I'd like to call call upon churches and ministers and pastors to, to do this with with old um with old branches because the, the the rough old branch, you know, strung together in a cross or something, the rough old branch symbolizes the roughness and the and the and the horribleness of this situation and 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 of the death of Jesus. You know, everything's so clinical, has been so clinical, hasn't it? And you know, we have these clinical crosses and, and stuff, but but something that says that I just gathered these two sticks or whatever and I put them together for you. Um, and this, you know, this represents how how hard the situation is um, for us all to even gather the right materials. Um, but here we are. And um, you know, and, and it wouldn't take much for people to. Um, to be encouraged to bring maybe just a flower with a name um, you know, attached to it um, and left there. Um, mm. And the, again, you know, we must be contacting each other. You need to touch. You need to touch the same thing. You can't. You don't have to. You you, you know you can't and you, and you wouldn't have to if you just left something, left something there. I think there are other things that can be done as well. Um, I was very struck. My mother-in-law is very elderly and living alone in lockdown. And the pastor of, the, of her local church turned up with a, carrying a stool and um, he rang the doorbell and then sat on the stool and they proceeded to have this conversation through the doorway. And I thought, isn't that great? <laughs> so the new sign of the pastor is not necessarily <laughs> having a dog collar. It might be carrying a stool. Um, yes. So, so I, I think, you know, there are, there are, we need to be innovative, don't we? Just finding ways of, of, of reaching out um, and uh, so often the challenge is uh, can we be creative enough can we can we find new ways of expressing uh, solidarity and compassion and humanity mm. and and in the villages, a, um, sorry in most villages there's um, or, or communities there's now a COVID face group mm. offering support for food and things and I think um, it's about coming alongside that kind of group and supporting them. Mm. Um, because yeah. then we gain respect. A lot of churches have been that have been the, um, taken the lead in, in being in, in offering the, the the help, the practical help, and going get to, going to get the food and the medicines and everything for people in the community. Um, that's just wonderful. When when the church becomes the the church is, should be the centre of the community. The church should be leading the way in loving and caring for people in the community. Um, and so it is, in my mind, it's the role of, of, a, of a local pastor to think, how can I help uh, to respond in this situation? How can I help people with their, with their suffering and their difficulty? How can we as a church and community do that? Um, so I think that's a, that's a brilliant expression. But one of the things that, um, that I was about to, to say just now is that the... Um, a lot of churches have put their, their worship online, but why is it that worship is going online um, to, to, to support only those who are believers in, in, in their worship? Why are we not um, thinking of creative ways of, of putting collective memorials online? 
um, you know, if I was, again, if I was in a cathedral um, at this point in time, I would be having um, a collective memorial of some sort um, and saying that we are here for the for the community. Mm -hmm. um, there isn't any reason why that can't, there can't be a an online collective memorial um, if one used one is one's imagination. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we'll hold a service for all those in this area who who are grieving, and you can tell us of your loved ones, and we'll put a picture of them up on the screen and the name or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, we can all you know. We can all be together in in in, in saying our goodbyes and, and saying mm. how important these people are to us in our lives. Mm. And John, you used to do that, didn't you, in the hospital? Yeah, we had a bereavement service for all the babies who who died, mm. and uh, and and it was that we asked um, parents who came along to write down cards with the name mm. of, of the babies, and some parents, of course, were writing a whole series of cards, all each with all the babies they'd lost. And um, and then the children, the siblings who were there, would bring these names, and we just have a simple service of dedication to God. And many people said it was just such a. I, I remember one mother saying, "This has just changed my life coming to this this uh, service." You know, I'm not a religious person, but but this is just the been something about this, the celebration of a life, particularly. Where there are lives that are that it's easy to be just ignored, you know, maybe at the two extremes of age, you know, either somebody, a tiny little baby who just was here today and gone, or else somebody, an elderly person who's been in a institution somewhere and lonely and perhaps forgotten. Um, this gives an opportunity to celebrate, doesn't it? And 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 remember uh, that kind of memorialization is such an important part of our humanity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Great. We've got a few more questions before we finish. So, Bex, I don't know if you want to choose some of the ones that we've got. Well, I mean, I, I feel like this is a question, something to do with, John, what you mentioned earlier on, but I think is, is a really important question to ask in terms of dying well and what that, I know it's a, a big question to ask at this, this point, but I think it's, it's an important one. And I, wondered what your thoughts were on that phrase, die, dying well, and what that might look like. Yeah, thanks. I've actually written a book about it, but um, I, I, I've come to the conclusion that you can't really talk about a good death. And I find mm. I'm, I, I feel uncomfortable with with that phrase because 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 death, I think, is always an enemy mm. and, and we can't sanitize it. Uh, but I think you can talk about what it means to die well. Um, but I, and actually, this is again a very long tradition. You know, back in the med medieval period, the church had these. There were self-help documents circulating around the churches that were called in Latin the Ars Moriendi, which just means the art of dying. And and the interesting thing is, these weren't intended for priests and and religious professionals. These were self-help documents for lay people. And somebody said a modern equivalent would be something like dying for dummies which I thought was such a great title. I was very tempted to call my book Dying for Dummies, but unfortunately the copyrights had already gone. But um, I think that idea that, you know, here is a self-help manual. This is, this is ways you can prepare for death or help someone else who knows they're dying. Um, the, the, but, you know, I have to say that when I was writing this book two or three years ago, I was thinking about somebody dying a long, slow death from something like cancer or you know, dementia, some kind of degenerative condition, where you get a lot of warning that this is coming. You know? And of course, what we're in now, the situation in the pandemic is, is that tragically, death can strike very, very fast. And, and we've seen cases of people who, you know, literally over a matter of hours have, have suddenly deteriorated and have gone from having a bit of a fever and not too bad to suddenly developing acute breathlessness. And the next thing they're being carted off in an ambulance and that's the last you see of them. And, and so what it, what it really has brought home to me is that it's too late to be having the conversation once we've got infected. Um, we actually need to be having this conversation with our loved ones now while we're healthy um, be because we don't know that you know that sudden death uh, might might strike and however difficult it is you know i think um we need to start having these these conversations and, and in particular 
I think there are two fundamental questions we need to ask if we're trying to help somebody else. And, and the first question is, what are you really frightened about? If you, if you knew you were dying, what would you be most worried about? And number two, what would you long to happen? If you, you know, what, what would be your dream uh, that might happen if you knew that you were dying? And I think there's, those two questions are just a way of, of helping people to start to think about the process of dying. And, and think about their own concerns, both the fears and their, their longings. Great, thank you. Anyone else would like to add to that? Well, just anything you can do which might help your loved ones in their grief journey mm -hmm. is a very loving act. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having that letter hidden away there, which is expressing the kind of funeral you want and um, just expressing your, your wishes. We don't, we don't often have these conversations. Many people don't know whether, uh, you want your, whether your relatives want to be buried or cremated, for example. Uh, and that makes the early stages of grief very, very stressful. So mm -hmm. anything we can prepare and just put it in an envelope and put it in a file with the will somewhere safe mm -hmm. will at least you know you will be at least helping your loved ones, at least at that early stage. I always think people who have problems with grief um, have long-term problems because it get, gets messed up at the beginning, mm -hmm. at the early stages. And so if we get it right in the hospital, if the funeral directors, if the church gets it right, but we can also get it right by making preparation ourselves. So anything like that will certainly help your loved ones in the future. Thanks, yeah, Bill. I, and I, can I can I add to that just something yeah. to say that it, it, the more you do to prepare for death yourself and for other people, it, the easier it is for other people to grieve. Mm -hmm. But but also um, just to say that it's useful to to say this is what I would like. But if you can't do it um, for whatever reason, that's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes people can end up feeling very guilty, and particularly in this COVID situation, you know, not being able to fulfil loved one's wishes and yes. um, and so on. So, um, so just put the line. This is what I would like if it helps you to know that. Mm -hmm. But absolutely, what matters more than anything to me is that what is is what you're able to do and you feel comfortable with. Okay. Thanks, Yvonne. I mean, this is a quick answer because we haven't got much time left. The question is to Yvonne and Bill. Um, a couple of questions on who do you go to uh, what if you don't have the option of a counsellor and you're grieving but also Sally's question of um, how do we help people say goodbye and grieve now when they can't attend a funeral service so it's people that are grieving what do they do um, Bill, Yvonne have you got any signposts for us uh, we can put links afterwards in the Facebook chat atalos.org is, is designed for this purpose um, website especially to signpost um, bereaved people to support services got all the main um, support services on there and an increasing number of local um, support initiatives which we're wanting to just encourage more and more people to tell us about you know if they're doing something locally um, but it's there it's there for the bereaved and it's got special pages for covid death um, how to be um, and how to help each other um, and, a, and an online grief chat service um, um, almost 20 to 24 seven, therefore um, by, um, staffed by counsellors to help people. Getting accessing counsellors is really hard. Um, very often they're, they're oversubscribed or they're, or they're very expensive. Um, so um, that's, that's hard. I do know that the Association of Christian Counsellors has offered, has offered uh, a number of Christians who are part of that network have offered time for free over this period. Um, for those um, who feel like they need counselling support as well. Great, and that link actually is on our Facebook already. Um, Bex, I think you've got a final question for Hannah. Well, I just, I just wondered if I could ask each of you. Um, we've, we've talked a lot about um, loss and, and death, and, it, and it's been incredibly helpful. Um, and I just wondered whether I could ask each of you to talk, just maybe talk about something that gives you hope um something that maybe through this time has has encouraged you and and kind of made you hopeful for for the future um things that may, maybe we've learned as a community um just to kind of end maybe on a on a note of of hope um so i wonder john if we could start with you would that be all right yes thank you um 
I think one of the things we're just being reminded of is about the importance of our physical embodiment. I mean, it's in, in a sense, we, we take our bodies so much for granted. We've taken so much for granted the fact that we've been able just to give one another a hug or uh, shake hands or just have all these normal human things. And it's, and it's the fact they've been taken away from us Actually, I hope and pray that it will. It, these things will seem more precious to us mm. uh, one, once they're given back. And um, you know, I'm very interested in the way technology um, uh, is developing. And there's a, there's a danger that technology is actually encouraging us more and more to be disembodied, to 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 downplay the physical side of us. And, and I, I think we're learning in a new way. Yes, technology is wonderful, but it cannot replace the face-to-face, -face, physical mm -hmm. part of our humanity. Uh, and, and I think we're learning that in a new way. And I pray, God, that, that we will treasure it more uh, eventually, that we're learning the hard way how important it is to be physically engaged with one another. Thank you. Bill, do you have any thoughts? Well, just that I think, you know, human beings are made in God's image and every human being is special. And it's amazing how human beings are resilient. Mm -hmm. We have been resilient, we are resilient, and we will be resilient because God is at work in us, whether we believe in him or not, I believe. Um, and I think that just says, you know, we at this time more than ever, we just need to be kind to ourselves care for ourselves, appreciate ourselves, and appreciate that which you have every day. I think it was John O'Donnell who said, um, if you watch the sun rise and the sun set every day for three weeks, you cannot be depressed <laughs> because there's something about creativity there that embodies you. And uh, that sun gives me hope. Thank you. That's lovely. And Yvonne? Yes, I mean, similarly, I think there's something about um, being bereaved that brings us back to the priorities of life. Mm -hmm. And I think our situation at, um, now is, is, fa is fa everyone's facing mortality and it's a little bit like being bereaved. Um, it's, it's, they're having to think, well, gosh, you know, we might die. And what that, one of the positives of all of that is that it makes us realise how precious life is. Um, and how, how blessed we are to have each day. Um, and I think it's, it's all about counting our blessings and coming back to the simplicity of, of life and the, the priorities, which are about relationships and, and our friends and our families and, and caring for each other. And it's just been so lovely to see how people have responded to care for neighbours and, and so on. And we've, we've kind of got a little bit too um, selfish on, in the rat race. And now we're not in the rat race um, and we're back living again. And, um, and let's hope we carry on um, appreciating each day and appreciating each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for contributing. Thank you for your questions and being part of our discussion tonight, audience, whether you are on YouTube or Facebook. Thank you so much to our panel, to Dave Adcock, who sadly wasn't with us, to John Wyatt, Bill Merrington, and of um, Tullock, not Tullo. Um, really big thank you to Bex as my co-host, really grateful for you. If you feel like your questions haven't been answered and you'd like to ask them a bit more, I'm sure if you post them on the Facebook page, um, somebody will respond from this panel and try and help you a bit more. All of the links that we've suggested will come up on the Facebook group afterwards as well. But thanks so much for listening. If you've enjoyed it, then please share it with friends and encourage them to watch it. Thanks so much for coming this evening. Bye-bye.